Hello. Thank you all for coming and welcome back to IBA ICS's webinar series topics, where we're hoping to deliver some informational and thought provoking discussions to help you run your business. My name is Nick Talenda. I'm a network security product manager here at ICS. I've been with the company for about 14 years, starting out as a tier one. And currently I head a team uh, that's tasked with opening and maintaining merchant accounts, providing PCI guidance for customers. Licensing and supporting our antivirus and firewall custom our firewall products, maintaining our internet backup product called Auto Vigilance. Now, outside of the office, you're going to see me at some of the ICA shows. I'll regularly attend PCI conferences. I sometimes go to training events that are run in partnership with the FBI to help protect infrastructure like the payment systems. And I participate in industry groups dedicated to advocating for small merchant needs. Today, we're going to discuss some things to keep in mind that you can use to secure your business. The goals for this seminar are to give you a high level overview of security concepts. We're going to cover multiple areas of concern, not just security uh, in, in the sense of protection against malicious intent, but stability as well. We're not going to, we're going to use lessons learned from PCI to frame this discussion. Uh, and I know that's a topic that a lot of people are a little bit burned out on, but it's something that we've all heard before, so we can use that as a basis. Our guidance is going to be based here on general security best practices. It's up to the individual or business ultimately to determine what level of exposure to risk that they're comfortable with and how they want to go about dealing with that. But we're certainly going to do our best to try and help you think through that. But if there's one lesson that you learned today that it's the only lesson that you take with you, please let it be this. The, that the benefits of adopting security best practices are usually only fully realized by those who fail to implement them in time. There tends to be a resistance to adopt uh, practices or spend money that doesn't directly equate to revenue. Uh, people will invest in their facility because it's the place that they do business and you might invest in your people because they perform the work and, and make everything happen. Inventory and consumables, you've, you've got to have something to sell. But in things like insurance and security, they, they protect the value, but they don't actually add revenue. Here, we're going to recognize that you lock your doors not because you know that someone's going to give it, uh, to try and break into your house, but because someone might. So in order to frame this, an approach that we're going to use is called defense in depth. You leave it up to the National Institute of Standards and Technology. They're going to say that information security strategy, uh, integrating people, technology, and operations capabilities to establish variable barriers across multiple layers and dimensions of the organization is a great definition. It is not. Uh, they went so far as to, on the page that I got this from, give us another even more riveting version of it that I'm not going to bore you with. What it really means for us is this. There's no single approach that'll protect against all attacks or issues that you're trying to protect against. A variety of controls with diverse methods provides the best protection. There's no one vitamin out there that's gonna, if I take it, gonna let me live to 150 years old. Just like I have to do the multiple things for myself, like exercise, eat well, and get regular checkups, security requires a layered approach. A diversity of controls that provides the best protection is the way to approach this. And your role as a business owner and operator is to cultivate a series of those controls that are unique to your business needs. We're going to take a look at those layers and, and see what it means to us. Here we're going to go over the, the layers of identifying the problem or the need to be solved. Identify what needs protection. Identify the various controls that can be used and then continually monitor and evolve your approach. Now that's the high level layers, but what do they actually mean when we take a closer look? The first step is gonna be identifying what need are we trying to solve for? What is it that we're trying to actually protect against? What requirements are being addressed? Are we trying to secure our facility? Are we trying to secure data, protect personnel possibly, or even a revenue stream protection? There's likely some combination of all of the above that it's going to be our intent. That's important to start where know where it is that we're starting. Are there going to be any frameworks that we need to follow? 
like PCI or service organizational control, SOC for short, uh, what contractual and legal obligations need to be met? There are going to be things that are specific to an industry that aren't going to be useful anywhere else. There might be things specific to a partnership, like with a service provider, that you need to do uh, because of a contract or, or some need of the other business. Businesses rely on each other to run. Stability and security are two-way streets. Just why, just while you may rely on your business partners or your service providers in order to run your business, they're relying on you to be safe and secure and stable in your business as well. Also, when identifying needs and uh, problems that we're trying to solve for, we need to seek legal counsel. Let the lawyers weigh in. They're going to know things that are specific to you, to your business, and to your location that you may not otherwise know about. That's what they're there for. Once you identify your needs in a broad way, we want to identify what the need touches, the scope of it. So to define the scope, we want to look at what systems or data are important with this. For protecting data, where does data live? It's a pretty common question if you talk about PCI. They want you to know where that credit card data is held. Who has access to that data? Things like that, that's important to know. You should ask yourself, what risk is associated if you do lose control of that data or do lose control of that uh, aspect of your business? Is it a privacy concern? Are you somehow giving out information that shouldn't be publicly accessible? Are you giving up access, maybe something uh, like a room that shouldn't be uh, open to the general public or, or something that you're trying to protect like your inventory? Could there be financial concerns? Are you going to lose money somehow, whether through lost business or through actual theft of cash or data? Um, finally, and, and most importantly, I think, is, is there safety concerns? Uh, is there physical safety that you need to worry about for your personnel? You want to also understand who is responsible for the security of whatever system or whatever data that it is that you're protecting. Again, another common thing for PCI. A lot of times you can get a shared responsibility with different service partners or vendors. Uh, something that would be called a shared responsibility matrix uh, is, is common for PCI world, but it identifies the different requirements that you have as a business, uh, things that you need to protect, and who's responsible for what level of protection on that. Uh, you may have a, an agreement with someone to maybe look after your network or or to change uh, some some locks on a daily on a, a regular basis. Uh, whatever the case may be, who is responsible for that particular control, and when does that take effect, and and where do you meet? Where do you overlap? So once you define the scope of what you're protecting, how do you protect it? How do you do it? You need to identify the controls that need to be used. Now, a lot of times there are specific frameworks that already prescribe how to go about doing something. Again, bringing up PCI version 4.0 is going to be coming out very shortly. It's already available for preview now, uh, but they have quite a few controls that tell you how to protect very specific things. A lot of it's concerning data, not all of it concerning your facilities, but it's a start. Again, also service organizational control, the SOC, that's going to have a lot of very similar aspects to it, but not always is there going to be a framework that's right for the picking. You're going to need to self-identify some needs that you may have in your own business. Those needs are going to be custom and they require honest thoughtfulness. And a great source of information for that is to talk to your peers, talk to your employees. They're going to have valid inputs. They're going to see things that are a concern to the business, but maybe from a different perspective than what you might be used to looking at. You also wanna understand how our control is gonna be implemented. Is it gonna be done in-house? Are you going to do all the work for this? Are you going to write the policies? Are you going to implement the technology? Yeah, how, how, how good are you at doing that? Do you have the time? Do you have the energy or the know-how? Are you gonna rely on the service provider, like a managed service provider to do some or all of the work? There are going to be controls that have overlap. Similar things may call for protecting something physical or restricting access to a uh, part of the facility uh, or keeping a record of something. If you can identify where the overlap occurs, you can consolidate your efforts and gain maximum efficiency on that. Once you are done identifying and implementing controls, that's not the end. When they're working, when they're implemented, you still need to go through and monitor and evolve them. 
you treat evaluation like a regular uh, of, of these things like a regular business asset. You want to have a continual uh, review of it. There's no point in doing something or keeping something around if it's not effective. So questions to ask here are, does it do its job? Might there be a better way to do that? Is there a better tool available? Another important thing to understand is where there are unexpected drawbacks. Things may look fantastic on paper, but in practice, there may be a hindrance to actually doing business like that. So you need to change your approach as the changes need. You always change a building for better curb appeal. You might change equipment to give a better wash. You change your marketing plan when, when you're not getting the notoriety or reputation that you need out of it. So threats and needs change too. And security really means in this case to keep ahead of those threats. And in order to do that, I'm gonna recommend five areas to keep it on your mind while addressing things for your business. It's gonna be facility control, data control, some business continuity, policy use and personnel. Now, they're obviously not the only areas that you're going to want to protect uh, to ensure the success of your business. Uh, there's other things like vendor selection, legal reviews, marketing, and so on and so forth. But starting with these five is going to give you the most ground covered quickest uh, and, and, and quite honestly, the most bang for your buck if you haven't done anything yet. I'm going to start off easy here with facility security. Facility security, you can't go wrong with locks. Uh, they're the obvious place to start here, and they protect things like physical records, you know, maybe your employees' employment records or W-2s, uh, any files that you may have on them. They'll protect your inventory, keep things uh, from walking off when they're not supposed to. Uh, you have money in your uh, site that you're going to definitely need to protect in the tails, uh, but also back in your safes and personnel. They need to be protected as well. Uh, not so obvious are going to be the network components, access to things like that, and, and computers. Uh, if I'm a bad guy, it's not going to take me long to add a USB uh, stick to your computer that's unattended. Uh, you could be out of the office for a couple of minutes. You could even be just turned around, and I could go ahead and reach around and, and put a, a USB stick on a computer when you're not looking. Why would I do that? Well, this is going to potentially give me access to Bluetooth technology, to Wi-Fi, uh, connected to your network there, uh, might install a keylogger to find passwords, uh, could even do things like audio and video recording. Uh, a device plugged into a network jack that's been left unattended can easily provide a backdoor into the network and, and still give the same uh, detriments that uh, the, the USB stick might. Persistent threats are very easy to introduce into a network, but admittedly, it's not the most com as common in our industry as maybe some other attacks. Uh, but it's still definitely something you want to think about. More to the point here, not all threats are malicious. Uh, if you have a guest uh, that is coming in for, say, a detail on your wash, uh, and they're going to be sticking around for about you know, half hour, hour, whatever it's going to take you to do that, maybe they're doing a webinar on security and they're running a little late and they need to finish up on things. Uh, that person plugs their laptop in and there might be a virus on their computer. Now that's got a leg up on getting onto your network as well. Certainly didn't mean to get it on your network. It wasn't malicious, but it's still a threat to the business. So we can enforce physical boundaries with locks, but then we need to log the activity. And how do we do that? Cameras, they're everywhere. And primarily they are a deterrent for theft and vandalism. Uh, let's face it, they keep honest people honest. They're not gonna stop anyone from robbing you by themselves, but they're going to ensure the safety of the people in the assets by recording everything and, and, and giving you that, that data that you can re review. They're going to help resolve disputes. Perhaps a customer comes in and says, hey, you know, my, my car didn't have the scratch before I went through your wash, or this person stole money from me. Well, you can go back and you can review that. Um, definitely, you can resolve those issues fairly easily. It's always re recommended that you... Uh, Keep month, sorry, three months available of your video for review uh, and archive it for at least one year, preferably more. Now, when we talk about easily accessible, what we're really talking about here is uh, if you needed to show someone some video, then you just go over to the DVR and you can hit a button and pull it right up. Uh, access uh, to an archive of a year or more is, is really important when there's longer term issues that need to be addressed. 
having something on a hard drive that you can still pull the information off of, you can still pull the video, that's gonna be important. I wanna show you why uh, with an example here. Again, I come from a PCI background, so a lot of this is gonna revolve around credit card data, but you can apply it to just about anything. When data is stolen uh, on a credit card uh, breach, th there's a timeline that happens. Uh, typically, it starts off with theft. The data is being taken from whoever. Uh, then there's a collection period. The data that is being stolen by the bad guy uh, also has other data that's being put with that's similar. So the bad guy might be having multiple streams of credit card information coming into them, and they're collecting it all in one spot. When they're done collecting everything, uh, they, they want to put it together and sell it. And whoever buys this information is going to perform a test of the quality of that information. want we'll to make sure that the goods are good. So there's going to be a few low key, low dollar amount tests that occur. And just to make sure that the credit card data that's taken is again, usable. Once it's proven that it's usable, then the other bad guy can use it to illegally purchase goods and service all over the place. Uh, up to this point, there's really no indication to the cardholder or to the business that had them information taken that there's been any issues. Now we're going to start seeing these little tests occur and cardholders are going to start noticing on their card statements uh, things that don't look right. And there's going to be challenges to that in the form of chargebacks. And when the chargebacks hit a certain point, the card brands will notice they'll do what's called a common point of purchase. And it looks for similarities between things. It looks to see if uh, these groups of cards were all used at the same business or in the same geographic region. They'll, they'll identify a business or a group of businesses more likely that have similar profiles. And usually when they're notified about it, all that's really asked of them is to remediate and become PCI compliant if it's not too bad. But in huge events, and we've heard of these in the past, specifically speaking when it's a big box story that we've all heard, um, and millions of dollars lost, but it can be small mom and pop shops that get hit by this too. A forensic analysis is gonna be required and a very costly uh, analysis that, that could include fines and fees from the card brands themselves. We no we know, we know longer wanna get there, right? Um, so when this is brought to somebody's attention, they need to go back and find out where the breach happened, where, where the problem occurred. And it took time to get here. It took time to steal the data. It took time to sell the data. It takes time to notice the charges, to identify the trends, and it takes time to remediate. So that's why it's important to be able to hold that historical data on log files as well as cameras. And back to the topic, uh, one of the easiest to implement facility controls is quite honestly by far the most effective. And that's gonna be a walk around. People that are at a location every day are going to be the ones that are most likely to see things that are out of the ordinary. I'm working at a car wash as an example. I'm going to see daily that there's this weird car that's been parked in a lot where it shouldn't be. Maybe we should get it towed. Or maybe it's sitting out on the street. Still kind of weird to see it there because we don't ever see anyone go in or out of it. Is it neglected? Is it someone's car? Who knows? But it's starting the questions. It's coming to our attention that we need to start thinking about things and, and maybe doing a little bit of investigation. Another thing that I bring up to people is look for devices that are suddenly looking new or maybe seating uh, wherever they're installed just a little bit differently. Uh, as an example, again, going back to my, uh, uh, my job here as a credit card specialist, we're, we're going to have times where you may have a scammer or a skimmer put onto a, uh, a credit card machine. You know, people are hitting these credit card machines with their uh, windows and, and mirrors all the time, uh, and it's going to scratch up. And maybe one day when I come in, the next day, uh, it, it's it's a brand new credit card reader. It looks brand new. Well, as a business owner and operator, I don't remember ordering anything, but that doesn't mean that my manager didn't. So again, it prompts me to ask. Maybe it did get replaced. Maybe someone put a skimmer on top of it. We don't know until we check. Uh, lastly, look for network devices suddenly appearing. And I don't just mean the obvious by walking around and seeing a new piece of equipment in the office and saying, where did this come from? Although that too, I mean, we all have cell phones in our pockets. All of our cell phones, as far as I would be willing to bet, can look at Wi-Fi. Look for new Wi-Fi networks that didn't exist before. Just do a scan once in a while. 
things like this are going to point you in a direction of maybe you got a new neighbor that just put a new network online. Maybe it's someone that's put something into your network so that they have access to it. Now we've talked about facility controls, but let's talk about how to pre protect those networks. Easiest way to do that is with a firewall. The firewall is a traffic cop and kind of the bouncer of a network. Uh, there's a couple of different controls that are or features on a firewall that you need to look for. The biggest one being the ability to segment traffic. We it's where we take one private network, meaning the one that you're using at your office, and you can carve it into many sub networks that are specifically purposed to do things. You're going to have a point of sale network necessarily, and that's probably going to be pretty tightly controlled. But then maybe you have a management network that you want a little bit less controlled so that you can still do your marketing and still answer emails. Perhaps you have a camera network that you want to throttle the bandwidth, make sure that you're not losing uh, any uh, quality for the rest of uh, your internet services at the site when you're using your cameras remotely so you can control how much data that gets. Perhaps you just want that guest network and keep that person that's working on the last minute webinar from being able to accidentally give you a virus. Um, having a segmentation on the network allows for two additional systems to be used. One is going to be an intrusion prevention system. The analogy I typically use when talking to people about this is like we're on a sidewalk with each other and we're just going about our business. Maybe I have my headphones in, I'm listening to music, popping along, dancing, and we walk by each other because there's nothing out of the ordinary about that. It's just another person on the street. However, if I suddenly furrow my brow a little bit, lock eyes with you, lean in, angrily walk at you, you're gonna think that there's something wrong. You're gonna get a little bit scared about that and you're gonna wanna know what's happening. That's what intrusion prevention does. It's the firewall's way of looking at the traffic and identifying what's a danger and what can be ignored and dealing with it uh, consequently. Another thing that it gives us access to if you have segmented networks is uh, an access control list. Access control is a, is a ability to define what places are allowed to go to and what places are allowed to be received or have that data received from. What I mean by that is if I am on network and I have an access control that says you can't go anywhere except for processing credit cards, I'm pretty sure that I'm not going to be able to go on Facebook and accidentally download a virus through a bad link. Uh, or maybe my boss doesn't want me going on a gambling website. These are all ways of controlling that flow of data in an effort to not only uh, uh, train the behavior of whoever's using it, but also if there's ever something on the network, such as malicious code, that's trying to send data back home that it shouldn't, it gets stopped. Also, it works the other way. If someone's trying to come into the network and it's not from a valid place that the firewall knows about, the firewall has a chance now to stop it. One final thing uh, that you should look for on a firewall is gateway antivirus. It's uh, it's a typical antivirus, but it looks for malicious code that's piggybacking on the data as it comes into the network and moves throughout the network, uh, trying to catch it before it lands on the device. Now, for firewalls, ICS has long since used sonic walls uh, to deliver to our customers this level of control over their networks. And recently, uh, we started offering the SonicWall TZ270. Uh, it contains all the features on the last slide that we just saw, content filtering, intrusion prevention, gateway antivirus, but it also includes some support features as well. As long as this device is licensed, it's covered by SonicWall for replacement if there's ever an issue where it fails, and it goes beyond a regular warranty for that. Um, it also includes a seventh generation firmware with the newest threat detection engines. It's fancy way of saying it does what it does very well. Um, most importantly, we feel is that ICS sends these out with a pre-hardened working configuration. What that means is that we've taken the time to look at specifically PCI, but security in general, and make the setup of the firewall something that can be applied to the broadest range of our customers so that you can be setting it up easily, uh, plug it in and go almost immediately with very minimal adjustment. Now, hardened network is a first step, but a layered defense that we're talking about calls for defending the devices individually as well. We do that through an antivirus program. 
ICS uh, or an antivirus uh, program is protection for that individual device. And it does two main things. It ins inspects storage uh, for viruses that are hiding in files that are not being used. Now, if you're not using the file, it's not doing anything. So it's able to catch that sort of lurking in the background. But what happens when files are running? It's going to inspect memory now, of course, for files that are running in the background so that it's not actively doing anything. Uh, virus antivirus is recommended for any machine that you may have at your site. Or none, doesn't matter what network it's on. It's If it's there, it probably should be covered. But it is absolutely required specifically by PCI for any devices that are on a cardholder environment. And when we talk about the segmentation again, we talk about the point of sale network example. You might have a, a site server, a point of sale, maybe a couple of uh, unattended terminals that are being uh, used, and they all have credit card readers on them. Every single one of those computers must have a uh, antivirus on it. But things outside of the fence, maybe on the management network or on the uh, camera network, it's great if you put antivirus on them. Highly recommend it, but then that's not a requirement. So it's important to understand the difference between those two. Now, ICS has uh, partnered with ESET for a long time, and we offer current protection through their cloud solution, their cloud protect solution. What this means for our customers is that it, it's, it's a level of convenience that we've uh, never been able to offer before. Uh, in the past, it took a, uh, a yearly uh, call so that we could apply a license to each individual uh, device on site. Now everything's being pushed remotely via an update. So as long as the license is paid for, my team can go through, hit a button, and make sure that the license is current. We can do group profiles. And this doesn't mean too much for just a single business or, or a small mom and pop shop. Uh, but if you have a franchise or are part of a multi-site operation, we can group all the sites together to ensure that the security profiles that we agree upon with you are able to be applied to every device that's under your control and under our watch. We can also create group exclusions fairly easily. Virus antivirus programs look for programs that look like they may do something malicious. Uh, but sometimes they falsely find things, and, and the thing that you're trying to use, the thing that's being caught, is actually something useful. Well, if you have a piece of custom software that you're running on one of these devices, and you want to make sure that it gets excluded from the virus scan, we can do that. And we can apply to every computer once we know what that piece of software is with, again, the click of a button. This also allows us, uh, this, this platform also allows us to see uh, certain aspects of the health of computers as well. So it's important that you reboot your computers on a regular basis, perform all your Windows updates. But if you're not doing that, we can actually see that and recommend that you can do that uh, if we're on the phone with you or uh, if you call us and say, hey, what's what's the recommended way to, to just handle our network? Uh, we can get some recommendations and, and guide you in the right direction. Now, network protection is definitely needed by the firewall and, and the uh, the antivirus in today's always connected environment. But uh, let's talk about what happens if that connection is lost and you continue to do business. So this becomes a business continuity issue uh, and a need for internet redundancy. Better than 80% of the car wash tickets nowadays are cashless. Uh, and so being unable to take a payment or or sell something is going to hit you hard and it's going to hit you quick if you ever lose internet. Reasons for outages can be varied. It can start with weather damage. Uh, the Northeast has been, been pounded by rain for the last couple of days here and uh, there's tree branches down all over the place. Uh, the wires can come down because of car accidents, even construction. Network congestion may be a big uh, factor. If you're in a rural area and your internet service providers sometimes can't handle the uh, availability um, uh, during peak hours, you might have a, a loss of revenue there. Faulty equipment's another thing. Faulty equipment is a big thing too, actually, because it's not even just equipment that you own. It could be the internet service provider has a switch that goes down. Nothing broke that was, that was in transit. It was just something on their end that went down and they need time to fix. So any internet backup solution that you have should have a different delivery method than your main internet service provider to avoid most of these issues. What I mean by that is if you have cable modem, probably you don't want another cable modem uh, as your backup because if the cable breaks, it's still not gonna come to you. Instead, what you should probably look for is something like a cellular backup. 
Uh, that way, if the cable goes down, but the cellular tower is still up, you can still process cards. You can still get onto the internet as you need. You definitely want to look for something with a quick ROI or a quick, quick return on investment. This is a backup. This is not a primary use uh, internet. So you, you don't want to have to spend an arm and leg for something that you may not need to use, that you hopefully don't need to use, but you still want to be covered by it. And also you want to make sure that if it is a cellular network that you're using for a backup, that you're doing a business plan, not an individual plan. I hear a lot of times that there's uh, uh, unlimited data that I can get from one of the big name carriers if I just add this onto my plan. It's all well and good, except for the fact that that unlimited is actually throttled, so it's slowed down after a certain amount of data is used. Uh, and it's also not preferred on the network. In a, in a big situation where there's a lot of outages, maybe a big storm rips through, uh, the business plans are going to be the ones that get the data first uh, uh, before the individual plans get them. So ICS has a solution here with our auto vigilance backup internet solution. It's an automatic failover. It goes in tandem with our firewalls that we provide to our customers. And the, the logic uh, will, will be based that if your main internet goes down, you can still process credit cards, giving you high availability to continue running your business. Uh, it is a set of business class cellular plan. So again, the data is gonna be preferred on the network. Uh, and it won't be throttled. Uh, it's going to be low upfront costs. We structured this so that it is a quick return on investment uh, because there's expected limited use on that. So we were able to structure it in such a way that you kind of pay as you need it for the most part, uh, which means that if you're down even for a couple of hours once a year, this may actually pay for itself. This is the type of level of return on investment that you really want to look for. Now, while losing internet is bad, it's not the only business impacting incident that, it, that can occur. Uh, you can run into break-ins, fire, storms. Like I said, the Northeast has been pounded recently. Uh, there can be accidents outside, altercations on site, maybe even medical emergencies. These are all things that can slow your flow of business and, and potentially open you up uh, for, for some harm uh, business-wise. Uh, so the way that you deal with that is having an incident response plan. An incident response plan is something that can help you limit financial damage, reputational damage, uh, any loss of data, any downtime, uh, things like that. It's something that you think about ahead of time so that you're not thinking about things in the moment of an emergency. Uh, if your internet goes down, what do you do? That's the quickest way to recover. If you think that there's a fire, what do you do? What's the quickest way to get it? Not only put out, but taken care of with the insurance company and, and, and documented with the appropriate authorities. So anything that can alter your business uh, uh, in a negative way, you, you want to try and think about different scenarios and come up with an action plan for it. It doesn't need to be super detailed, but it should contain a minimum of a description of the actions to take, uh, maybe an order of the actions that you need to perform. Uh, you definitely need to have a place to record information that needs to be recorded. Um, so you know, prompting your employees to find uh, out names and addresses of people involved or contact information, record times, maybe if there's devices on the network that we report what devices we're looking at, uh, thoughts in general that you, when you go and look at later will help in determining what happened and, and making things better. Definitely want to put down in a uh, business continuity plan, a contact information for key personnel, emergency services, and business partners. As a business owner and operator, you're not going to be at the office 24 hours a day, seven days a week, although I'm sure it feels like that sometimes. Uh, you do need to let somebody else be in charge once in a while. So this is going to make sure that anyone that needs to know that may not be at the office or may not be at the site is is able to be communicated to in a in a, a short amount of time. Just having this plan isn't going to be enough though. You have to have people that are willing to use it and able to use it. So that's your staff. Has your staff been trained on any incident response plan that you have that they agree to use it? If they know about it but they're not going to use it, what good is it? So make sure that they agree to use it. Make sure that it's readily available to them. You don't want to have them fussing around and trying to find something. Have it right out in the open where they can get to it, so that way they can use it and it can be its maximum efficiency for you. Now, a business, uh, an incident response plan needs to be reviewed. There, there's no good uh, in a plan that's been sitting on a shelf getting dusty for 20 years. It's no longer valid. So 
review it. How often do you have to review it is up to you, but it does need to be reviewed on a regular basis. But in your review, also, you need to get input on it. Don't just unilaterally change things on it. Ask your employees, ask your business partners, ask your peers what they're doing for certain things as well. You need to have input on it because uh, it's going to give you a fuller picture uh, than if you just go and, and check off a few boxes once a year and say, yeah, that's good enough. Now, talking about some business continuity issues, uh, again, going back to the uh, credit card uh, realm, there's one quick business uh, uh, insurance that I do want to talk about, and that's cybersecurity. I'm not going to take a lot of time to talk about this, but there's just a few things that I wanted to make sure that you have uh, uh, available to you, um, just some things to think about. Uh, cyber insurance uh, usually covers private forensic investigators. So like if something goes bad and you have data stolen, it, it covers the person that comes in and uh, will define what happened and, and how did things happen. And it will usually also cover notification and remediation of the people that had their data stolen. Um, but it doesn't always cover legal fees that you may have. Uh, it doesn't always cover brand fines and fees. So it is possible uh, that that you may be left holding the bag in a bad situation like that. So you want to make sure what the fine print says. And especially, uh, it probably doesn't make victims whole. What I mean by that is, if my credit card information was was taken and I'm out a thousand dollars or two thousand uh, dollars on my uh, bank account, well, you know, you might be on the hook for that if you're the reason that that happens. So you got to make sure what that fine uh, fine uh, verbiage says. And make sure that you understand it. Uh, you may already have this. Uh, it can be included with existing processing accounts. Uh, ICS's uh, processors do, for the most part, include that. And if you have a question, you can give my team a call. We'll be happy to discuss that with you. And uh, it may exist as a writer with any additional business insurance that you may have. Uh, you want to question what the limits might be. Limit per account uh, and a limit per incident. I may have three accounts, but I'm only covered for maybe uh, uh, two of those accounts, such as if I have $100,000 per account uh, coverage uh, on three accounts, but there might be a $200,000 cap, things like that you want to question. Uh, and then you also want to know when coverage starts and stops. Uh, you know, is there a delayed start to the policy? Uh, are there any things that you need to file with the insurance company in order for it to start? Uh, when does a claim need to be filed for use? And is there a time limit to submit damages? All things that you want to keep in mind. Uh, again, I didn't want to get too deep in the weeds on that one, but I did want to bring some of these questions to your attention because these are good things to know and important things to ask. But let's talk about a different but equally important type of policy, operational policy. Uh, quite honestly, uh, quite simply, a, the purpose of a policy is not going to be to control employees, but to empower them to support the business. Uh, and in order to do that, they need to be written with a few things in mind. So when you write a good policy, it's going to articulate a specific goal. Uh, those goals will identify actions that help you achieve them, but it's also going to identify boundaries for the behavior. Uh, an action will tend to be prescriptive, uh, thou shalt, if you will. It's going to give best practices for desired outcomes. Now, boundary is going to be the exact opposite, thou shalt not. It's going to give you warnings to avoid undesirable outcomes. Policies are going to need to be flexible from time to time uh, for them to be effective. Not everything is going to fit every, or not any policy is going to fit every single event. So you might want to add some flexibility into it, but that needs to be very limited. So you need to make provisions within the policy to see when it's appropriate for a policy to be bent. Who can make that call and how do they give that authorization? You've got to protect not only the business with the policy, but you've almost also got to protect the employees and let them know that it's okay in certain circumstances to go outside of policy, but they need to know how that's going to be, how it looks to them and how that authorization is going to protect them. Um, speaking about employees, the best written policy is useless without someone to use it. That's going to be your people. People are the single most valuable asset to a business. And, uh, you want to make sure that you train them early and often. Uh, if you get their commitment from the beginning, it makes it a lot easier uh, in order to have them be part of the business. Uh, you want to make them a part of the process. Giving context to goals, processes, and procedures 
gives them buy-in on something. They understand it a lot better and they understand why it's important. And you want to favor encouragement instead of punitive actions. Uh, please follow the policy for these reasons instead of follow the policy or else. By the time you're writing somebody up or threatening to uh, uh, go through and, and, and uh, you know, fire them or something like that, you've, you've, you've lost something. There, there's something that's not right there. Um, so do the work ahead of time. Make sure that you have the buy-in from everyone. Above all, make sure that you recognize their value. A, an employee, when their value is recognized, is going to uh, be engaged with the business. They're going to help build a good reputation. They're going to add value to your business. They're going to in, enforce loyalty from your customers. They're going to be wanting to do business with you over and over again because they enjoy the, the people that you have there. And more most importantly, those employees are going to be remain involved and invested with your business. If you don't recognize their value, they're, they're not going to be engaged. If they're not going to be engaged, you're not going to be likely to follow anything that you're going to uh, ask them to do. They're going to tarnish your reputation. They're going to be less efficient. They're going to discourage loyalty with your customers because if the employees don't want to be there, why would the customers want to be there? And the employees are going to be more likely to ignore policies and procedures. So in review, I just want to say that the best approach to security is going to be a multifaceted one. You need a diversity of controls uh, in order to be successful here. Uh, you want to have continual improvement, stay ahead of threats, both malicious and not malicious ones. And while you're looking at these areas to protect, keep in mind the five important ones that I've described today. Facility control to control uh, the security for physical things, data control for security of information, business continuity to protect your ability to do business, policies for making a framework that you can do business in in a way that you approve and the people that are going to follow those policies and they're a great sort of in, source of insight uh, and the gate gaining your buy-in is a must i want to thank you for joining us today and listening and uh shannon i do believe that there were a couple questions that uh, you were signaling came in i'm going to try and answer some of them now hopefully for you uh, let me just go ahead and open this up. And just so you know, if uh, you take a look at the screen there, there's a couple of additional resources that you might want to check out. Just some things for data security that I put on there. Yes, we do have a couple questions. Um, the first question is from Sergio. He asked um, about the Sonic wall firewall. Um, is it pre-installed with the ICS systems, or can we get one if we if we want to? So, good question. The the, the firewall is our response to customers not having uh, good network components years ago, starting actually back in 2015. Uh, we saw the need for something a little bit better that we could offer our customers. Um, the trick here is that we don't enforce that you buy the firewall through us. We just have it available. Um, and so any of our customers can certainly purchase one of these devices through us and we will support you through and through on it. Um, but there is going to be a time when we will encounter a customer that has a different idea. They think that they can do it better with a different brand. Uh, there might be a managed security service provider local to you that you want to use, uh, or maybe you're large enough that you have your own IT. That's fine as well. Um, but yes, our customers can always certainly buy these uh, devices through us and uh, we'll be happy to, to work with you on them. Our next question is from Bet Betty. Uh, she asks, I'm constantly having a couple companies try to bill me for antivirus or ask me to download their antivirus program on my computer. I'm always confused as to whether or not I should take it because I believe Microsoft has a built-in defender, but I'm not entirely sure. So there's a couple things about that. Um, you know, Without really knowing all the background, uh, I, I question as to how you're getting these prompts. If it's just spam email, I'd probably uh, ignore that. Uh, but again, it brings up the question, uh, is is the Windows Defender good enough? Um, we don't think so. That's why we offer ESET to our customers. And, and you, you can certainly use that through us uh, if you're one of our customers. But um, the the other side of that is, uh, anything is, is better than nothing. So Windows Defender is a start. Um, but if you feel that ESET's not for you, or if you have a different use case for it, you can certainly use another brand. 
but I would encourage that you look for a reputable brand. Look for some reviews online. Make sure that you're the one instigating the transaction though. Uh, again, I, I, I have a tendency to uh, not believe too much of what I see coming through the email um, unless I'm the one that started the conversation. So just be careful on that, but absolutely a paid version of a antivirus program is best though, because this is something that takes a lot of work for them to identify viruses on a continual basis. Uh, many, many different threats are detected each day, and it takes a staff to, to run that. I, I'm not quite confident that a free version of any antivirus program is going to be sufficient to truly protect you. It, it takes time and resources. We have another question from Jason. Uh, he asked, how often uh, does PCI perform an audit? Okay, so that's a fairly uh, uh, straightforward question, believe it or not. Um, PCI, per their requirements, uh, they, they make allotments for a yearly self or a yearly audit, uh, either a self-assessment uh, audit that you would do if you're a small business, uh, or you could do one of the larger uh, audits where you have a third party come in and, and do the assessment for you. Um, there are quarterly scans, generally speaking, that are needed uh, as part of your ongoing PCI compliance effort. Uh, sometimes if you have specific relief from a processor, uh, and there are certain circumstances with the processors that ICS uses where they don't require the quarterly scan, uh, but that's going to be something unique to that processor. Again, I would encourage you to talk to my team. We can guide you through that process and, and tell you exactly what you need. But overall, yes, it's a yearly thing and with four quarterly scans uh, that need to be performed in the in the absence of any relief from the processor directly. Oh, we have an, a question from a Adam. Uh, he asked for any more information regarding the security of c customer data. That would be very helpful. That would also be a very long topic. Uh, it's one of those things where you just need to start pulling a thread and, and go from there. Uh, you know, th this webinar that we have today did touch briefly on what it takes to uh, start securing data. Um, but that that is a much deeper discussion and, and that is a rabbit hole that can go down fairly deep. Um, again, on screen right now, there's a couple of resources on the right hand side. Uh, PCI security standards is a great starting spot. They do have uh, standards that are specifically meant for payment card. However, it can be applied to a multitude of things, not just payment card. It, it will protect a lot more than just that, but that was their goal in writing the standards that they did. Um, also, NIST and CISA.gov uh, are two government-related uh, places to go to to keep aware of any emerging threats digitally. Um, and then, you know, just just stay aware, subscribe to their uh, mailing list, and uh, you'll see things about best practices that come up on occasion. Um, my mailbox, uh, usually I go through weekly just to make sure that I'm staying up on, on any of the current threats. Um, but it, a lot of times those are talking about the, the actual viruses. So also look into, uh, you know, any of the, the frameworks uh, we talked about PCI, of course, but also the, uh, the, the SOC frameworks as well. Uh, AJ asked, uh, best practices for using remote viewers to log into servers at local sites? Remote viewing. I'm glad you asked that question, KJ. Thank you for that. So there's a couple things to understand about remote viewing. Uh, remote viewing can be very, very um, insecure. Uh, at least it was a, a long time ago. ICS uses something called uh, Beyond Trust, uh, or it used to be called BombGuard. It's a device that we control uh, that creates a... Uh, a secure connection between our environment and your environment. So whenever you let us in, uh, that little code that we put in, uh, that's what we're we're having you connect to. Um, that goes through our PCI audit process as a service provider, and it's been proven to be effective. And and so that's why we continue to use that. Why we only use that. Um, 
that's not really something that you can use, however. So you'd have to use more off the uh, off the shelf, uh, readily market, uh, readily available things on the market, such as Team Viewer, Bog Me In, something like that. There's nothing that we're going to recommend specifically, but I will recommend that you need to look for things that have secure auth authentication uh, that uses two factor authentication or multi factor authentication. So multi factor. Um, and this is where I can start talking for hours on end about it, but a real quick multi-factor authentication is a combination of something you have, something you are, or something you know. So if you have a password and a challenge token on an authenticator app on your phone, that satisfies it. And what that does is it makes sure that you're you're who you are. It's more uh, uh, agreeable to the system that uh, you're identifying that you're you're the proper person and not someone trying to uh, to, to steal uh, access to something. So look for multi-factor authentication. Sorry, didn't mean to get technical there. Uh, look for multi-factor authentication and don't share passwords. That, that's something I see a lot. Um, there tends to be a situation where if you're a site owner and then you have a manager and then possibly a district manager or, or maybe an assistant manager that need to be able to get into a, a site on a regular basis, that I see people sharing those passwords on those other uh, uh, logins. Don't do that because if you are all using the same login and something happens, how do I identify where that uh, issue really came from? Where did where did the breakdown happen? And it's not necessarily just to point fingers and blame people. It's also to just learn from it. Uh, everyone gets their own login. Everyone uses two factor, and it's probably the best way to go. Again, like the antivirus, make sure it's a reputable company. Do your research on that. Um, Alec asked, what makes SonicWall a top pick in the car wash industry? Does ICS support other firewalls or plan to in the future? Well, um, it's a top pick uh, for us because we're, we're, we're quite, quite friendly with them. We've gone back a while. We like their product. Uh, we've, uh, since about 2015, been using them to sell to our customers because of the value that they uh, included. Um, firewalls can be fairly expensive, especially with the licensing that goes into it. Uh, Sonicwall gave us the, the best value for the protection that was offered, uh, and uh, we're very familiar with how it works, so we, we like the way it works. We're not likely to change at any point, I would say. But I'm not going to stop anyone from using another type of firewall if they prefer it. There's there's plenty out there. WatchGuard, Fortinet, uh, there's Cisco routers as well, or firewalls as well. Um, again, anything that you want to use is is great as as long as you're doing something. Uh, the big drawback for us would be if we have a customer that's using something that's not one of the firewalls that we provided to them. It's kind of limited in what we can do. We can talk to you about. Uh, best practices again, uh, if you call in for support, but we may not be making the changes that you might want. So you, you'll have to ensure that you can support it if you're using something that we didn't send you. Uh, Kevin asked, with the cradle point failover device, what is involved in the setup? So if the internet goes down, it switches over to the cellular. So uh, the question really is, what's the logic used to identify when when the main internet goes down? Uh, there, there's two methods that you can see uh, used with cellular backup modems. One is going to be an inline method, which is not what ICS uses. Uh, we do a load balancing method. So um, keeping it real simple, what that says is we have two different internets coming into the firewall, and then the firewall's watching across those channels and seeing which one is up and which one is not. Uh, working. Uh, if we see that the main internet goes down, the firewall is actually what's uh, moving everything to the other uh, internet package uh, so or the other internet stream. So the, the logic's all built into the firewall there. The modem, we keep that one very simple. Uh, we, we keep it so that it, it's just sitting there and it knows it can go out to credit card companies um, and it's very specific to an ICS installation. Uh, but yeah, it, it's it's uh, definitely a function of the firewall. Uh, if you're not using our firewall or if you want to use something different, you can do an inline method. Again, you know, if you're one of our customers, we can certainly uh, uh, tell you about that and, and discuss it with you. Uh, but we find that our way typically works best, uh, mainly because it's cheap uh, and it's very high availability. Uh, 
Ron asked, is there a SOC report available for ICS operations and how do our customers access it or ask about it? So the, the SOC report uh, that you're referring to there, um, that's not something that I know of off the top of my head. Again, I'm more credit card related. Uh, that's more of an operational thing at a, at a business level. So that's something that uh, you can call in and request. Uh, I, I want to say that we're working towards it or, or that we're in the middle of an evaluation for it right now. Please don't hold me to that because, again, that's not my department. Uh, as far as requesting it, uh, you can request anything that you want uh, as our customer from us. It's not going to be something that's going to be readily available necessarily on our website, uh, but as our customer with, with you know, support through ICS, you can certainly give us a call and ask for things like that. And we can uh, see what we have available for you. Um, I will say that, uh, you know, th there, there is a very strong uh, uh, directive in ICS to be as secure as we possibly can, uh, not only for ourselves, but for our customers. Um, so anything that we do, it's evaluated uh, the procedures and policies, not just to protect our networks and to protect our uh, our employees, but it's also so that our employees are protecting you and your customers. Um, so, you know, absolutely, I, I see where that uh, can be important, uh, but you're going to want to ask that through the support channels and, and we can see what we can do about getting that for you. And I want to say that uh, that was the last uh, question that we have time for. Again, I do want to thank you all for uh, joining us today. Uh, as a reminder, this webinar has been recorded. It's going to be available on our website for your review. Uh, if there's anyone that you think might get anything out of that, please direct them to the website as well. Let them, let them see what we've talked about today. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us. Uh, any questions that we didn't get to, I'll go ahead and, and uh, uh, get a, uh, a collection together and make sure that we do get those questions answered. Have a great day and thank you for choosing ICS.